Welcome to episode 210 of the Ski Podcast and thanks for joining us, listener. Today we're going to be discussing the ski resort of Bakira in Spain and finding out about the country in the world that is growing faster than any other in terms of skiing and that is China. Now my name's Ian Martin, I'd like to introduce my guest today. I'm delighted to welcome two first-timers to the show this week. Firstly, we have freelance journalist Gabby Le Breton. Uh, hi Gabby, how are you today? Hello, very good, thank you. Lovely to be here for the first time, as you say. Uh, and whereabouts are you? Um, I'm in deepest, darkest rural Kent. Yeah, near the coast, surrounded by apple trees. <laughs> okay, sounds wonderful. I'm a, I'm a, uh, I can never remember if I'm a Kentish man or a man of Kent. It's to do with uh, whether you're north or south of the Medway, isn't it? I think East. I'm a Kentish man myself. <laughs> Excellent. And my second guest today, also a first time on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Justin Downs, president of Axis Leisure, who are major players in the development of skiing in China. Uh, hi, Justin. How are you? I'm good, Ian. Good to meet you. Thanks for having me on. Remind us where you are today. Well, I couldn't be any further different than where Gabby is. I'm in bright and sunny Beijing, about five kilometers from Tiananmen Square. So right in the thick of the action. Right. OK. Well, I mean, I did know you were there. And thank you very much for fitting this into your schedule, because what time of the day is it for you? It's uh, six o'clock. So not too bad. Yes. Excellent. I really appreciate that. One question I always like to start off with with my guests is to ask you when you skied or snowboarded last. Uh, Gabby, when was that for you? Um, I was in Swiss Alps and Andermatt. 25th of March was my last ski day of the season. Yeah, it was a funny, it was a funny few days. It was very stormy and cold and then got really hot in the <laughs> In the afternoons, got nice and slushy. So yeah, it was it was a it was a suitable end to my season. I'm great. Excellent. Fun. Well, I'm a big a big fan of Andermatt. I've been there several times in the last few years. For a little while, Switzerland Tourism was sponsoring the podcast. And you may know that I had Mike Gore, who's the uh, CEO of yeah. Rail Resorts in Andermatt, on the podcast in episode 204. And that is a really interesting story. Uh, evidently, it's been a couple of years now since uh, Vail Resorts purchased uh, Andermatt. Did you see any evident changes at all that you know might uh, hint at that partnership? I think the most evident changes I noticed were the presence of Americans, because I've, yeah. I've never encountered them in Andermatt before. <laughs> So that that was very interesting. I mean, brilliantly, I, I, I waited. I was waiting for a bus with a chap who's actually from Seattle. And I was asking him how he found it. And he said he found it absolutely terrifying. He said, I never know if I'm going to follow a route and fall off a mountain or end up in a really cute little village, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. I've known the resort since I was eight. So there have been a, a lot of changes, obviously, in that time. It's developing in mostly positive ways. I think the infrastructure on the mountain has benefited from the Vale Resorts investment, clearly. And there's a new cotton club that's just opened, run by a really eccentric Norwegian couple, uh, which is, I think, going to really set a whole new scene for the resort in terms of glamour and apre and fine dining. I mean, it's interesting as well to hear you mentioned the number of Americans that you noticed in Andamat. And certainly because of the Epic Pass and the Icon Pass, I think we've been seeing more uh, Americans coming to Europe. And I actually watched a video, I'll, I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but they were talking about the differences they found between the States and Europe and how horrified they were about the fact you could kind of ski anywhere. No one stops you skiing down, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the backcountry areas or even closed peaks for example yeah it's very unsanitized shall we say in comparison with the US for sure yeah and that applies to lift use as well as they point out in there but I'll, I'll put a link into show notes about that uh, Justin what about yourself when were you last on snow well not quite as glamorous as Andermatt I must say but I was in one of our indoor ski domes in Wuhan which is south central China last Friday so less than one week ago uh, which is always an interesting, you know, you're not going to fall off any cliffs or go anywhere where you're going to get lost <laughs> in one of these indoor ski domes, but they're quite the going concern, as I'm sure you've heard about uh, in regard to Chinese ski industry development. Last weekend, I was actually up for the final weekend of our, uh, in our Olympic cluster, uh, the, the venue for the freestyle skiing events for the 2022 games. I did the last day of uh, skiing up there 
very mild. I think it was 17 degrees Celsius at the time. So definitely time for the season to close. That is very interesting. We're talking about China in more detail a little bit later on. I'm particularly interested in those indoor slopes as well, because I know that they are growing uh, very fast uh, as well. But as you both referred to, the season is drawing to a close, but it's still possible to ski in a few resorts. And uh, I've asked a couple of our regular contributors to send us in a snow report. So let's hear from them. Hi, everyone. It's Andy over in St. Anton on Tuesday, the 23rd of April. Um, with a split resort weather and snow update. Split because St. Anton is now actually closed for the winter, but the last week of the season, the 14th to the 21st of April, was pretty phenomenal. Um, the resort closed on the 21st, um, Sunday the 21st, after the, the famous Weisse Rouse, the white noise race um, down the mountain, being made famous over the over many, many years now, um, was actually done for the first time in a long time in dumping powder snow. Uh, which was quite uh, a new experience for all the racers. But between this 14th and 21st of April, um, the snow has been pretty incredible. Over 70 centimetres of fresh snow fell throughout that week, leaving two or three of probably the best powder days of the whole winter. You couldn't tell if it was the middle of January or the end of April. It really was that spectacular and that special. Temperatures were cold. um, It was quite stormy. Visibility wasn't great, but the snow conditions were fantastic. Um, which really made a a super end for everybody who was left in resort. Um, But as I said, resort closed on the 21st. So what do you do when the resort closes? You go to the next resort that's open, and that was Ischgl, just 45 minutes down down the valley. Um, Everybody's probably heard of Ischgl for their famous closing parties, and indeed the Black Eyed Peas are doing the big closing party on top of the mountain on the 30th. Um, So I was lucky enough to spend the whole day today skiing in fresh powder snow. Um, It's dumped just as much snow there as it has in St. Anton. It's a fantastic skier in Ischgl. The weather was very mixed today. Um, It was quite cloudy, so higher up around the sort of like 2,500 and above. It was very, very cloudy, very misty foggy. You couldn't really see your hand in front of your face. But once you dropped down under sort of 2,400, 2,300 metres, the visibility was uh, was a lot better. Skiing between the trees was superb. And in the pockets of sunshine, when the sun shined out, it really was quite glorious. It was about minus eight, um, which is would seem quite cold, but it didn't feel cold at all until the wind blew. But the snow throughout the whole resort was superb. Right the way down back to the village, you were skiing fresh lines, fresh tracks pretty much all day. So in terms of April skiing, this was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I can't remember uh, many past Aprils being this good but certainly for the last couple of years April skiing has been absolutely tremendous it's the way forward it's the future the resort's quiet it's lovely the slopes are quiet there's no lift queues Um, it really is a dreamy time to ski but that's me over and out for the last report of the season thank you very much for listening thank you Ian for all the updates and I hope you all have a great summer cheers hi Ian and ski podcast listeners this is Susie here out in Chamonix Winter has returned again with snow falling regularly last week down to valley level and at least 50 to 60 centimetres of new snow above 2,000 metres. There were some excellent powder days last week at Grand Monte. Wednesday and Thursday in particular were fantastic. The sun even made an appearance and the days just got better and better. This week, so far, the weather is pretty mixed. It's cloudy with morning frost and a cold north wind with light snow falling down as low as six to 800 metres in places. We have the Gramonte ski area still open until Sunday the 5th of May, so nearly two weeks left of the season. Today the piece was skiing well at Gramonte, mostly cold snow on well-groomed pistes, with only a few patches of ice and Saharan stands still poking through. Off piece there was about 5 to 10 centimetres of new snow from last night and this morning, light cold powder on top of the previous snow, so excellent conditions off piste. It's not possible to ski the piece to the bottom of the Gramonte, you do have to download in the cable car now. With the large volume of snow at altitude, the ski touring is still great around the Gramonte and also from the Aguida Midi and the Skyway lifts on the Italian side. Coming up to celebrate the final day of the season is the free ride day at Gramonte on Sunday the 5th of May. This year's theme is La Préhistoire, or Dress Up as a Dinosaur. There'll be music, the usual water slide and other festivities to enjoy. 
Wishing you all a great last couple of weeks of the season. Thanks, Ian. Bye. Hi, this is Alex from Tip Top Ski Coaching here in Les Alp uh, with the latest snow report. Temperatures are wintry, um, minus 12 without the wind chill on the glacier this morning uh, and cold in resort as well, uh, below freezing. Uh, we've had uh, fresh snow every other day for the last few days uh, and we're due more fresh snow tonight and tomorrow uh, with temperatures staying low. Uh, the actual snow conditions on the piste are wintry, uh, perfect corduroy piece uh, all the way down to 2,600, even in the Belcom area, actually, and will be even better after a bit more snowfall again tomorrow. So what a fantastic end of the season. It seems winter doesn't want to leave us. Uh, so we'll be enjoying this last week of the full season and then starting our glacier season where we will be skiing through till the 7th of July here in Les Alpes. Now, Alex mentioned that skiing isn't stopping in Ladies Out yet. Regular listeners will know I was in Ladies Out earlier this month. And if you listen to our last episode, 209, you'll have heard my interview with Anthony Guzman from the lift company Aon about the new Jondry lift there. Now, while we were sitting down, I also asked them about their summer season. So let's have a listen to that. So again, I'm with uh, Anthony uh, Guzman, Sales and Marketing Director from uh, Sata and Eon, who run Ladies Out. We were just talking about the summer season that mm-hmm. you have here, because one of the great advantages of having a glacier is that you can ski, I mean, I guess notionally all year round, but you're going to have, uh, well, I guess roughly a two-month summer season, yes. and it's going to effectively start as soon as the winter's finished, right? Yes, April t- uh, 29th. Uh, the glacier will be available for ski clubs, but also for, for the public uh, until uh, July 7th. Okay. And during that period, ski clubs as well, but, you know, anyone can come along and like buy a lift ticket for the yes, day. Yes, absolutely. It will be, it's, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the glacier is the ski, uh, the ski area available. But it's really open to everyone. And I was up there today and I could see the kickers over to my right hand side as I was going up the tea bar. That that would be the snow park that's open uh, yes, up there. Uh, yeah. 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 Not my sort of thing. <laughs> but but good for good for someone as well. And you do a lot of work kind of just now to move the snow around to protect the glacier. To protect it, yes. The goal is to create a layer that actually protects the glacier and uh and, and it's working. When the skiing closes on the 7th of July, then your focus moves towards mountain biking Hikers, and, yes. and hiking, And right? hiking, absolutely. And then we will be open until the end of August, uh, 1st of September. Actually. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've seen the lower slopes, the snow's gone there, and you, uh, the people who I was with today saying, well, what's that there? And I said, that is a mountain bike track, you know, <laughs> yes. not the sort of one that we yes. would go down, yes. but you know, some incredible yes. turns and uh, berms yeah. through there. And I saw in the woods over to the right, there's yeah. some jumps and things like that yeah. as yes. well. Yeah. We, we, are, we opened the mountain uh, biking uh, activity um, in uh, June 15th, on June 15th. Right. Okay. So it will be, there's a there's a, there's a transition between skiing and uh, and and mountain biking. There's lots of mountain bike races and competitions here in summer. I know there's trail running races as well. And actually, a little while ago, I interviewed uh, Mathieu Blanchard, the uh, ultra runner, who told me that one of the reasons he bases himself here isn't just because he can run around the park. There's a crown mm. It's because he can do all the other activities. Yes. You know, he's like five minutes from his door. And I've been here in summer. It's great fun. That's really interesting. Skiing still available through to July in ladies out now normally our feedback section comes later in the show but as we're on ladies out now i thought i'd address an email from mike greenland he said uh, i was surprised that monsieur guzman thought the new lift wouldn't lead to crowding as my impression is there are already too many beds in the resort he goes on to say that i've skied for over 50 years in all the major resorts in europe and i felt this ladies out was a crowded ski area and it wasn't even half term or easter Well, uh, thanks for that feedback, Mike. I mean, it's interesting to hear what you think. All I can say is it's not been my experience. And I've been there at Easter a couple of times. I can't speak for half term. People who know Ladies Alp a bit better, I I guess probably in the Cret area where most of the lessons take place, it can get a bit busy. uh, And there's a funnel with a blue run coming down to Jaundry too. Uh, But otherwise, my experience is there's lots of space. And here's my tip for anyone going to Ladies Out, uh, especially if you're looking for space, head down to the Fay area or down to Signal uh, off the glacier. Both of those runs are generally empty, big uh, and wide. Uh, one final piece of news. I'd like to give Messy Weekend a shout out. When I was in Verbier, uh, 
can't remember what episode that was now, but I'll put a link to it in the show notes. I lost my goggles. It was entirely my own fault. Uh, I didn't secure them properly on the uh, ski out from uh, the off piece we did. Uh, but I reached out to them and they sent me some new ones. Uh, so I really want to give them uh, a huge uh, shout out. Uh, and for what it's worth, I also do my trail running in Messy Weekend uh, Sunnies. So I uh, highly recommend them. I uh, actually did the South Downs Way 50 at the weekend. So I'm, I'm feeling it a little bit uh, right now. Finally, I was lucky enough to get another gift sent through this week. Uh, it's a visor from a brand called Valon. It's a very retro style. Uh, so they're a Swedish brand. To be honest with you, it's not actually my thing, but my wife is very keen. She's going to be wearing it this summer, if and when the sun ever comes out. Um, if you'd like to know what it looks like, you can see a pic in the show notes. It's sold out at the moment, but I think it's coming back into stock soon. Gabby, you look like you knew that brand, uh, Valon. They also do sunnies and goggles as well. They do. They oh, they kindly sent me a pair of goggles, and I love them. They're absolutely brilliant. It's a really cool brand, isn't it? Style and substance. Have you have you looked at have you looked at these visors at all? Then I have a bit like you. Perhaps I can't quite see myself utilizing one, so I, I didn't take up the kind offer to trial one. Um, but yeah, I, I know people swear by them. Tennis, I think they're very handy playing. Exactly, tennis. exactly. They're I mean they're very Bjorn Borg style. I tell you what, Gabby, let's move let's move out of the Alps and uh, completely and move down to the Pyrenees, because one of the reasons I wanted to have you uh, on the show is because recently you went out to the Spanish Pyrenees and and regular listeners will know I visited a lot of the resorts in the French Pyrenees, but I've never covered the Spanish Pyrenees. I did actually go to Bakira uh, a long time ago. I think it was probably 1988. So long ago that at that time they had a one-man chair. I imagine it's very different now. Um, so I'm really pleased to have you on, Gabby, uh, to tell us about it. Where, when were you out there? I was out there, gosh, was it late February or early March, thereabouts. Um, I I was colossally lucky. I got there and everyone was saying, oh, my God, it's the best day of the season. <laughs> so we arrived. It was chucking it down with snow. All, you know, all the great things. And then it was a bluebird day the next day and then it snowed some more and we had another bluebird day. So I have a completely unrealistic view of skiing <laughs> in Bacera, but I think I've, I've wanted to go there for the best part of 20 years. So this was a very long overdue visit and I was blown away by the, the, the scale of the terrain, the quality of the grooming and the accessibility of the off-piste. I, I, I was so impressed by that because you, you know, as you'll know from so many European resorts might have vast off-piece kind of backcountry terrain but you have to hike or tour or skin or you know whatever it is to access it but in Bacara you just literally step off a lift and it's right there it's extraordinary and then you ski down and step onto another lift. Firstly I wonder if we could just clarify you know where it is people understand the Pyrenees you know that ring uh, that ridge of mountains that goes across uh, from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. It's on the eastern side. Where did you fly into? Where's the best place to access it from? The best place to access it is not where I flew into. Um, <laughs> so the, the best place for transfers is Toulouse. And from there, it's about a two-hour, very scenic road transfer. Because So Bacada sits literally on the border of France. So it's in, an autonomous little community. Um, a bit like Andorra. It's just to the west of Andorra. We flew into Barcelona, which was very special because you fly, you know, into that city with the beach and the sea. And then it's a quite hefty four hour transfer, which is, again, very scenic and perfect if you want to bookend a ski trip with a city break or a beach break. But if you're just going to ski, then it would be advisable to fly into Toulouse. So Bacada sits in the Val d'Aran which in Occitan means the valley of the valley. It's a fantastically scenic kind of cleft that runs up towards the French border, spanning 35 miles. It's got 33 little villages dotted along it, each of which has its own Romanesque church and little old slate and timber buildings. It's all engulfed by national parks, so you get a tremendous wealth of wildlife brown bears and eagles and vultures and you name it, they're all hovering around there. So it's purely as a cultural and so visual feast. It's it's a special trip, even without the skiing. 
And you mentioned the off piece, but what about the actual piece themselves? How many do you, do you want to give us an idea of the kind of size of the area in terms of the number of pieces and lifts, etc.? It's very impressive. And I, I was again, I was surprised by the piece skiing. Um, they're 165 kilometers of pieces, so that puts it in comparison with that's more actually than Courchevel, than Grindelwald, Bengen, more than Sölden in terms of skiable terrain, which America kind of North American users might be more familiar with. It's got 2,273 hectares, which is bigger than Vale and bigger than Aspen. So there are 165 kilometres apiece, most of which are intermediate. And there are five kilometres of ungroomed itineraries. Um, so it's it's a really impressive spread. It's all linked by, I think, 38 lifts, which have, as you say, come on since you're one man chair. <laughs> And the ski area spans five mountains, so it's quite spread out, which enables you to have a feeling of travelling between the different areas um, and experience different, you know, different mountains, different angles, you know, depending on the time of day and the sun and the angles, you can you can pick your terrain accordingly. And what's the kind of altitude of the resort and highest points? Bakeda and Beret are two individual settlements, as it were. It was a purpose-built resort built in 1964 um, by the Spanish, um, and Bakeda sits at 1500, and Beret sits at 1850. Remarkably similar to Courchevel, <laughs> it tops out at Cap de Bakiva at 2610. For a point of reference, Courchevel tops out at 2740. Um, so it's it's quite comparable in terms of stats for Courchevel in terms of altitude, size, grooming, I would say, even as well. But it's a more home it's a much more homespun kind of vibe to it all. It's it's definitely you you have the whole Latin, Spanish kind of chill thing. Everyone's very attractive and wearing beautiful ski kit. They're very good skiers. It is definitely a resort where everyone skis really well. Um, which is you know quite fun because you're inspired by seeing these people kind of whooping off cliffs and everything it's like it feels more like a verbier or an engelberg in that way but with that laid back kind of latin vibe going on okay i mean that's kind of interesting it's not it's not kind of how i visualized it are you making quite a few comparisons with courcheval there i seem to remember you know when i went back in the day one of the big things they used to say is this is where the royal family went is it full of you know she she clientele like that and you know the michelin star restaurants and things like you get in courcheval there is definitely that yeah the spanish family still come that they have a very subtle, very low key. You wouldn't know it until someone points it out to you. A little kind of enclave there. They still come, and histor- they've come since the very beginning. So they were there from 1964. They very much their their entourage, as it were. Those the Spaniards who like to be seen are there for sure. So there's like a Fuzelp store. You know, there are pretty glamorous shops. There's a Lionel Messi hotel with a really incredible restaurant there. there are, there's a Veuve Clicquot champagne bar on the Pistes, which sells the most Veuve of any place in the whole of Spain. Even though it only has a three-month season, it still sells more per year than anywhere else. There is definitely that. There's that kind of vibe, but it's not um, overpowering as well, or as homogenous as the likes of Cushvel. Others. Right. And you compared it to Verbier and Engelberg. So I'm guessing there's more of a kind of core type of skier who goes there as well. But you said the piece are mainly intermediate. So it works for families. Yeah, 100% works for families. Yeah. Yeah. And lots of I, I didn't experience so much, but I know Peter Hardy, who I'm sure has been on your podcast. He's, you know, the, the ski writer extraordinaire. And Tom Robbins, who's the um, Financial Times and travel editor they, they've both experienced this the way that it's the resort tends to be very quiet in the mornings um because everyone's out until like midnight including the kids and you know all the fans. <laughs> and yeah. then so if you get up early you have this bonus of like really quiet mornings without the hordes of people there 
Yeah, for sure. I seem to recall that when we used to go, uh, we went on a couple of camping holidays with the kids to Spain. And you could tell when we first arrived, we were the weird uh, British people who were having dinner at kind of six o'clock in the evening. And then as the holiday went on, we gradually transitioned to eating later and later and later and later as they as they do in Spain. Uh, you mentioned the backcountry side of things as well. When I've only heli skied in two places uh, in my life, and one of them was in Bakira uh, back in the day, principally because it was an incredibly good value compared with everyone else. Is that still an option out there? It's still, yeah, it's still an option. Um, it's quite a, it's a smallish tenure. It's not on a scale of, you know, British Columbia or something. It's, I think it's a 400 kilometer square tenure, but it's exclusive and they only run one chopper a day. So if if you choose to go heli skiing there, you will have that entire tenure just to your to your group. Um, and by all accounts, I mean yeah, if you read Tom Robbins' feature about heli skiing and Bakera and the FT, you know it sounds magical. <laughs> you do these drops, you ski down to these remote little villages or hamlets, and you just eat kind of traditional food with a dog lying by the fire. I mean, it, it must be magical. It's, I would have loved to, but I genuinely, I did not need to because the the accessible terrain that we experienced was just, it was just mind blowing. It was brilliant. And we, we did one, a, a shortish hike to ski down into a little village. And that, you know, that in itself was magical. It was the guide we had is a, a female guide called Laya, who's known as like one of the best skiers in Bakeda. She ha- She runs a little ski school. She lives there, so and she just took us on. She called it our adventure day, <laughs> so, and we just lapped all these runs and descents. I mean, it was it was magic. Outside of the the Verve Clico bar, would you say it represents good value, pretty good value compared with, let's say, the French and Swiss Alps? Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. The Verve bar is not cheap. <laughs> Messi's place is definitely not cheap, um, but you know you can get. I had a iberian steak acorn fed you know organic on the mountain for 20 euros um which i think is is really good value and like the the bar at the base of the main ski area pints of beer cost just under five euros and the and the lift pass is also it's 300 euros for a six-day pass which you know is is less than or certainly less than the likes of selden i think i think val Sunny was the only one that was vaguely comparable in terms of price from my my research so yeah it's good value across the board ski rental is less um it's all less <laughs> oh okay well it sounds it sounds great i have been there before but that doesn't mean that uh, it shouldn't be added to my list of places to uh, to go and visit so i really appreciate you for sharing that uh, visit with us gabby and, and helping listeners find out more about it uh, if it's okay i'd like to move on to uh, justin now justin you've joined us from china I, we can tell from your accent uh, i guess that uh, you're not chinese um <laughs> you've had a quite long background in the ski industry i wondered if i could just take you back because where, where are you from originally well, my story is very complicated. So for the benefit of my parents, I should say that I'm from Australia. But for the benefits of my career, I should say that I'm Canadian. And you mentioned Australia, you know, as well as what you're doing now in China, you kind of started off in ski area management in Australia. Were you running no. them at one time? No, I started my career in Whistler, actually, as, a, as an 18 year old. Just in the parking lot, that was the only job I could get was a parking lot attendant and kind of worked my way through every conceivable position. Uh, ended up in management and then in the development side of the business. So I, I did 10 years in Whistler, then I went to Panorama, which was also owned by IntraWest, which was the owner of Whistler at the time and was their head of, uh, of resort operations. I was there for a couple of years and then I went and started Kicking Horse, which uh, is on most big mountain skiers' bucket list uh, places to go. So I was the first employee and general manager of that project and built it uh, pretty bit similar to what it is still today. Not much development since I left in 2005, um, but I was there for five years and then I went to Australia for two years. Right. Okay. And how did that transition from being, you know, from managing ski areas in recognized countries, let's say, move towards founding access leisure and, and getting involved with the Chinese market? 
Yeah, like it's all by by chance. I mean, uh, obviously, Canadian Rockies, I guess, okay, at least to us is uh, one of the holy grails of the, the, the ski ski destinations in the world. And Kicking Horse was certainly, uh, and Whistler for that matter as well, uh, very recognizable and highly sought after places to go. I was at that at an age and had a young child at the time. So I didn't necessarily want to be just small town British Columbia. Uh, as, as exciting as it was, I kind of, I was still young. So I thought there's still a world out there to explore. And Australia came knocking and gave me a chance to pick wherever I wanted to live in Australia as long as I was willing to spend some time in the mountains. So I was looking after Mount Hotham primarily, but Falls Creek as well, uh, based out of Melbourne, which was a fantastic experience and got my daughter to be a little bit more worldly. And now she's living in London. So, you know, she's a, 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 you know, a travel creature by, by default from following her parents around. The resorts in Australia were ended up being sold and now actually are owned by Vail Resorts. So this name keeps on coming up. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah. so my, my job disappeared when the new owners came in and Interwest uh, was starting a division in China, ironically called uh, Intrawest China. And that was uh, to, to kind of bring North American resort development and operations know-how to China. So I was asked to come and join that uh, that team. So I was the pre- uh, senior VP of operations for the resort division. Un- unfortunately, that was a short-lived thing because we tried to do it during the global financial crisis. So people lost interest fairly quickly. And we re- realistically were about 10 years too early to try something as ambitious as what we were doing back in 2007, 2008. So I saw the the Chinese industry in every aspect, not skiing uh, solely, but anything to do with sport, wellness, tourism, recreation, anything to do with people getting out and uh, enjoying their lives. This industry was going to boom and there was no resources in the country that had any international expertise to support that. And I was here. So I thought, Mm -hmm. why not? I never thought I would be self-employed. I certainly never thought it would be in China. And here I am. (laughs) I I mean, that's a a very interesting journey to this point. I think it might be useful to give a bit of background about China and the state of skiing in China as well. Because, you know, for most people, they understand China, huge country, huge population. They might have seen, you know, the Beijing Winter Olympic Games, but they probably don't have any idea of the scale of skiing in China. And I have read some of the uh, uh, stats. I mean, you mentioned that indoor slope in Wuhan that you skied in uh, recently. I think I'm right in saying there's more indoor slopes in China than there are in the rest of the world combined. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, we we have 50 that are or 52 now that are in operation. And at least as far as my research and our uh, client network is concerned, there's another 12 in planning or in construction. So there is more indoor ski resorts, yes, than the rest of the world combined. And it still only represents about 8% of the total amount of ski destinations in the country. So we have a lot of outdoor destinations, uh, more than 800 now. Your definition of a destination might not be <laughs> the same as, as ours here, but anywhere where you can get slide up, get pulled up a mountain or sit on a chair and then slide down is considered a destination here. But, but these, uh, these seven or 8% of this, uh, of the total amount of destinations being indoor in China actually represents 20% of the total visitation for the entire country skier visits. So they're unbelievably important to the growth and introduction of the sport to Chinese. Yeah, I mean, that is really interesting. There are lots of questions uh, coming up uh, in my mind. But OK, you talk about percentages of the total skier visits. So to give uh, the listener a kind of benchmark, I think the total number of uh, skier uh, days in the States is around 50 million. So what is it in China just now? We don't have the data for this year yet. My, my, my prediction coming back to around February was that we were going to go around 31 million this year. So I still think that is, uh, is a reasonable target when we see the final statistics come out. The last, last year's visits, which was still hampered a little bit by COVID, we hit 22, just under 22 million. So, you know, we're seeing still significant growth percentage wise, and we still have a long way to go to, to, to get to North American numbers. But I believe that we'll be at that number and greater by 2025. So, you know, basically one more full year and we'll be we'll have the largest ski population in the world. But we also have kind of the largest population in general. So 
it's just a game of numbers. <laughs> As you say it's a game of numbers. I mean, those are some huge numbers. You know, I think I topped the show, the introduction with it's the fastest growing market. But um, uh, you haven't worked that out. But it sounds like a sort of 45% growth in a single year is that yeah well you just said? no that's 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 pretty much it so, so we're definitely you know we're, we're definitely exceeding pre-pandemic numbers which is not difficult you know we had the olympic games which spurred things on but over the past 10 years chinese skier visits have increased more than 300 percent. so it is the largest percentage-wise increase in the world but you know starting from a small number so it's with a big population it's kind of only got one way to go which is up but these numbers have no, they're, they're, you know, still represents a very small percentage of the overall population. Most of them, you say most international people have no idea about skiing in China. Well, I can tell you still most Chinese people have no idea about skiing in China. So there's still a long, you know, a long pathway of people to get involved. So in fact, you're talking about participation. Again, I think using the states as a benchmark, maybe 10, 11, 12 percent of people in the states are recognized as being skiers. So what would that participation level be in china and what do you think how much growth is there to come well i mean look you, you we can we can be uh, aggressive and and confident and say that you know you look at japan and korea in their heydays or japan specifically you're, you're in the 20 percentile of participants involved with skiing or snowboarding i mean if china does that then we're looking at you know a lot <laughs> 300 million people you know, that's a lot no, I look. I believe that we can get in the the seven or eight percent penetration market range. Like when I say we've done, we'll do thirty million skier visits. That's not thirty million individual visits. That's a cumulative number. But I still think that we're going to be in the uh, tens of millions of participants uh, in the coming three to five years. Yeah, well, that is pretty amazing. So Access Leisure, you know, you're president of Access Leisure. You're involved in developing skiing in China. There's clearly, you know, a, a, an increasing demand. But how do you, you know, if I, I know you're working on like indoor centers and outdoor, you know, resorts or uh, destinations, as you term them. How, how do you plan a ski resort if you can just start from scratch? Well, obviously, you've got to find the, the, the right band of climate. Uh, so if you're an outdoor resort, and, and, and to be honest, most places in China rely solely on man-made snow, uh, although we do have resorts, especially in the northwest of the country, which gets significant natural snowfall. But the majority of the skier visits fall in the northeast of the country, which is a very dry part. So you need to have good access to water water resources, obviously. So finding the right climate, the climate range, you know, we have perfect snowmaking conditions. It's a very dry, dry air, perfect for making snow, keeping keeping water at the right temperatures. The terrain is suitable for holding snow for long periods of time. But basically, of course, we're, we're looking for the right type of uh, gradients of, of ski area, of, of mountains, to build the right type of trails that suit the market. And the majority of the market is still the beginner market. We're kind of grooming here the the world's future skiers by te- te- teaching them how to ski indoors. Then they migrate to the to the smaller mountains by comparison to European mountains, and then eventually they're going to Japan, North America, and Europe. We've got severe, quite quite significant environmental restrictions, believe it or not, in China. They're very very sensitive to making sure that there's no degradation of the environment, not taking away farmland because there's lots of people to feed, not you know, using water resources uh, carelessly. Trees are a very, very expensive thing to get around in China. So removing trees is almost impossible. So you've got to kind of find these unique mountains that kind of don't require a lot of uh, impact on the environment themselves. And then have a base area that allows you to build a, you know, a real estate or, a, you know, transport accessibility and commercial activities like the Bob Clicquot Bar or these types of things eventually will come here as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that is really interesting. Look, you know, having so many thoughts as you're uh, discussing. I mean, certainly we've mentioned we keep referring back to Vale Resorts, but I think there are comparisons that can be made there. You know, one of the uh, a number of their acquisitions they've made have been these one hill resorts. You know, in places like Minnesota, etc., which they see as being their feeder resorts for uh, everything else on the Epic Pass. And so the role of that indoor market is really important for bringing people to those ski resorts uh, as well. And finding those uh, locations, I'm guessing evidently, uh, you know, a key part of it is you need to be able to find that spot, but it needs to be close to 
like a, a certain amount of population and they need to be able to get there what about the, the kind of infrastructure do you how does that work do you well, build it first and then get the infrastructure or do you only build it if you've got roads and trains etc going there well if you had have asked me this question 10 years ago it was backwards so you know they would either be building some massive development in the middle of nowhere and no way to get there or they built all the infrastructure and then nothing there once you get there so now it seems to be happening a little bit more organically and the government see the government is driving all of this and uh, they want this development just like Canada, just like Kicking Horse, when I went to Golden in, in the late 90s to around 2000, this was a relatively poor, struggling, blue-collar town from logging and railway and this type of thing. And they needed tourism in order to keep the town alive because these, these uh, heavy industries were not going to be the thing to sustain the town. So the same thing is happening in China. It's all about the central government wants people to stop moving to the cities. They want them to s develop their careers and their livelihoods and their families in these less urban environments. So having a population base nearby is not a problem in China because, again, we've got lots of people. But, yes, I mean, these places are remote, but the government is backing it up by building airports. High-speed rail is everywhere. So, you know, I mean, I can, it used to take me to go to the Olympic cluster, which – back in 2007, would have taken me six, seven hours to get to. It's only 200 kilometers away. Now I can be there in an hour on the train. The government is putting this infrastructure in. They have to. Right? It's not just moving people to the ski resorts. It's actually moving people back to urban environments and allowing them to maintain some sort of a modern life and not just be stuck in the middle of nowhere. So it all it's all hand in hand. It's really interesting. It, it it sounds like a kind of real life way of playing a game like The Sims or something, where you're sticking in all this in and towns and everything around that. But you've mentioned the Olympic cluster uh, several times, and obviously the Beijing Olympics. I'm guessing that has been pretty important in driving. You said awareness of skiing is relatively low, but that must have made a big difference. Yeah, I mean it's it definitely helped. But what I would say is even before we were given the green the green light on the bid. The industry was already on an upward trajectory. It was definitely going places. But what the Olympics did was guarantee its longevity. Things don't necessarily happen easily here without the government's backing, either financial or just general blessing. And if they don't like something, then they'll make it very difficult for everybody. Like golf course development is taboo subject in China because it was a very dim view by the Chinese government because of previous ways of going about the development. So thankfully, the Chinese government obviously stood on its uh, soapbox and said to the world that we are going to deliver the best Olympic Games, even though it was the middle of COVID. We're going to get people involved in this sport. And they're not backing down from that. So, of course, the Olympics uh, shone the light on the industry for Chinese people. They now know more about it than they did before. But the government is now still saying we need to keep this thing going. It wasn't, it's not a white elephant of an industry, let alone a white elephant of a venue. So we, we want the, the smaller communities, the private developers, the state-owned enterprises, the public to keep going with this. So they, they keep on making it easier for people to get involved. That is really good to uh, hear. There was a lot of talk when you know, the London Olympic Games took place. It was going to vitalize or revitalize people's interest in sport or young people's interest in sport. And maybe that hasn't particularly happened, but it sounds like that is happening over in China in relation to, to skiing and snowboarding. I wondered, there were some individuals who were very successful Chinese individuals who were very successful at Beijing, like Eileen Gu and uh, perhaps lesser known Su Yuming. How important were they or, or are they in the growth of Chinese skiing? Oh, look, these, these kids, which is what they are, are rock stars. The one thing about the Chinese, uh, let's just say, community as a, as a whole, to put them under one category, is they love their celebrities. They love their sports stars. And when Chinese athletes or celebrities, which they kind of both are both, they're not just athletes, but they're celebrities, uh, do well on a world stage. It, you're kind of like going to a Taylor Swift concert when you go to see Eileen Gu compete. Like they're not even really watching the competition. There's only one person there as far as they're concerned. And it's just, it's like a concert. It's quite unbelievable. It, it's inspiring people to get in the sport. Like these guys are really driving people's participation. There's no, no question about that. But the challenge for China is, okay, 
these guys, guys and girls can't keep going forever. So who's, what's the pipeline of the next generation of these types of influencers in the sport? So that's, that's really what China's trying to do right now is make sure that they're not just one hit wonders as far as performance goes. There's a, a long runway of these celebrity athletes to keep people enthusiastic. That sounds fascinating. I'm not surprised to hear those young skiers are influencing people. And I guess you're going to get more and more. If you think about Britain and our freestyle side of things, so many of those athletes started off skiing indoors. The fridge kids, as they were uh, termed, who've then gone on to achieve uh, Olympic success. So it seems uh, likely to me that with the uh, scale that China's got, that that is going to work uh, as well. There's evidently a lot of growth going on in China. What do you, what do you think the opportunities are? Obviously, your business is involved in in building resorts, building indoor snow areas. But do you think there's opportunities for existing snow sport businesses within China? Yes, absolutely. Look, I, I think I think it's just knowing knowing who your target audience is, and uh, you know, it's such a diverse market, such a huge country, just geographically, and there's very different types of businesses happening in different parts of the country. I mean, certainly on the education side uh, of things, I also represent uh, FIS, the International Ski Federation in China. So we're rolling out initiatives to ensure retention, but get people into competition because that's this is end goal is really about uh, professional athletes and competitions. And, you know, we don't have coaches. We, we barely have team managers. So it's run, run like a Chinese uh, kind of state-owned business, not really like a, a sporting association or anything like a more mature, sophisticated European or North American system might do. So, you know, we need the the expertise to train the talent and to train people how to run these things as good businesses and long, you know, long future pipelines of athletes to come. So, so yeah, on the educational side, both academic but also technical expertise, we definitely still need people and companies to come. China's developing a lot of its own technology, so I, I would I would hazard a guess that if there's we have say twenty new detachable chairlifts going in this year, I would probably be able to confidently tell you that there are twenty domestically made detachable lifts. So not that there's many lift companies in the world anyway; it's a little bit of a monopoly or duopoly. You know, I think China's developing its uh, its technologies in snowmaking, grooming, and, and lifts. So the heavy infrastructure maybe. A little bit more of a challenge, but there's still opportunity because people still respect an international brand. On things like apparel and equipment, there's it's a huge, huge market. And uh, yes, there's some big players already here in the market and doing very, very well. But like you were talking about your Swedish visor company, you know, you don't need a very big percentage of the market to do a very decent business here. You just have to find your niche. And I think people come in and go, ah, I just want I just want five percent of the market. Okay, well, you don't need 5%, you need 0.005%. And then you've got something meaningful. So don't try to be everything to everybody. Just come in and focus on one particular area or one particular aspect of the market. And I think that's that's where you, where, where you need to look. You know, all of that conversation, really fascinating. I think we're going to be revisiting uh, China and following how the snow sports industry progresses over there. Uh, over the next few years and uh, you know if indeed it does become the largest ski market in the world is as soon as 2025 that'd be amazing thanks so much justin for sharing all of that information uh, with us i really appreciate it uh, right we're gonna move towards the uh, close now uh, a note on feedback i enjoy all feedback about the show i like to know what you think especially about our features so please do contact me on social at the ski podcast or by email the ski podcast at gmail.com a few people have contacted me since the last episode. Uh, Oliver Rutman said, really great episode with Xavier De La Rue. He was also very complimentary about in sport in Engelberg. Uh, Quinn Resingo, possibly pronounced that wrong, uh, said, I found your podcast recently and have enjoyed listening. Uh, he goes on to say the I, he's an icon pass holder based in Reno who skied in the Dolomites and Kitzbühel. But normally he skis in Mount Rose, which has 60 kilometers apiece and is never crowded. Now, he asked for recommendations in Europe that are similar. And, Quinn, I'm going to refer you to Val Sine, which we covered in episode 205 and mentioned by Gabby a little earlier. One of those smaller resorts that actually has a decent amount of ski area and doesn't get overcrowded. Uh, uh, Gabby, on did for you had any suggestions you wanted to add uh, that type of um, category of resort? 
Yeah, I'm just my my brother's just come back from a family holiday to Valsani, and he he loved it. He um, went with low expectations and uh, returned with glowing, glowing praise. I mean, I I love some of the Austrian resorts, the smaller Austrian resorts like kind of Westendorf and St. Johann, places like that have real a lovely kind of vibe to them and access to obviously ginormous ski areas. There are so many ski resorts uh, in Europe. Uh, there are plenty to try, but there's a, a few suggestions for you, uh, Quinn. Also, I had another message from Darren Jur. He said, congratulations on getting the new Vale Resorts executive of Andermatt on your show, which was episode 204. He goes on to ask why I didn't ask the obvious questions. One of them Will you kick out all the thriving mum and pop restaurants and replace them with bowls of chili and Gatorade? Well, Gabby, you you were there. Have those those mum and pop restaurants haven't gone yet, have they? They haven't gone yet. No, the the old town of Andermatt is very little changed. Certainly, um, unfortunately, some of the hotels are standing empty, which is a bit sad. Yeah, there seems to be a feeling that people are trying to perhaps capitalise on the luxification of the resort as a whole and therefore plans to luxify existing hotels are in place but taking a while to come to fruition on the mountain the the restaurants remain largely the same they hadn't really changed anyway i I find it unlikely they'll ever uh, serve chili and gatorade but who knows, I could be proved wrong, but they have a very fine selection of restaurants and accommodation already uh, in Andermatt. And uh, we've had so much feedback about that episode 204 uh, about Vale Resorts. I'm sure this story will run and run. Uh, but we're just going to uh, move to close now. If you like the podcast, there are two things you can do to help. Just review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can subscribe so you never miss uh, an episode. If you do review us, it helps other listeners find us. And if that doesn't suit you, I even appreciate a comment on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube at Ski Podcast and all of those. Now, there are now 215 episodes of the Ski Podcast to catch up with. I had a look this morning and 134 were listened to in the last week. So if you do want some more ski chat to keep you going between seasons, there is plenty to listen to in our back catalogue. Just go to theskipodcast.com, search around the tags and categories, and you're bound to find something of interest to you. Uh, Also in the stats, I saw that in the last week, 56% of our listeners were in the UK, 13% in the States, and that means the remaining 31% are listening from around the world. Uh, Disappointingly, although I found listeners in Turkey, Vietnam and Japan, there were none in China. So maybe this episode uh, will change this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and Justin, Justin can be added to that list. Although, if you're using VPN, then people will never know. Yes, I will. I, I will be one of your one of your listeners. Uh, wherever you are in the world listening to this podcast, thank you for joining us. You can follow me at Skipedia and the podcast at Ski Podcast. But for now, I'd like to thank Intersport for sponsoring the show and thank my guest today, Gabby. Thank you very much. Delight. Thank you for hosting me. And Justin, thank you. Anytime. Thanks for having me. And finally, listener, thank you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye. Oh, 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 o